long enough. Um, thank you all for coming. We thought it would be fun to have a baseball program. We didn't know what would be happening in baseball right now when we planned this event, which is why we didn't give it a different title. But we knew just who to ask to come here, and that's Tom Clayton. Some of you know Tom, but for those of you who don't, I'll tell you a few things about him. Uh, Tom will explain his shirt, by the way. He's a best-selling author. <laughs> and has, he said, you're going to like my shirt, so I thought he would show up in a mint shirt. But he didn't. Okay. He's a best-selling author and has worked as a newspaper and web editor, magazine writer, TV and radio commentator, and a reporter for the New York Times covering entertainment, sports, and the environment. He's received awards from the Society of Professional Journalists, Marine Corps Heritage Foundation, and National Newspaper Association, and two of his books were nominated by their publishers for Pulitzer Prize consideration. Two of his books have actually been New York Times bestsellers, The Heart of Everything That Is, which he spoke about here at the library, and Halsey's Typhoon. Other books that have received popular and critical acclaim include The DiMaggio's, Last Man Out, Gil Hodges, R Roger Maris, Reckless, and The Last Stand of Fox Company. Um, and I think he has a few books for sale up here, if you want to browse later. Uh, Tom's professional positions have included working in a newspaper game on Eastern, uh, on Eastern Long Island, 15 years as a roving editor or writer for the New York Times, a managing editor of the East Hampton Star, editor-in-chief of the independent chain of weeklies, and writing arts features and the farther east column for the press news group. Gradually, writing nonfiction books became his full-time occupation. His latest projects are a book with Bob Drury on old 666, the B-17 bomber, that had the most decorated crew of World War II, and a solo author, a book on the Dodge City days of Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson. Also on tap is the feature film adaptation of The Heart of Everything. And that's where the bio ends because I think I lost page two. But I will tell you, <laughs> and he can finish it up. But I will tell you that um, Tom will be here at the library in November. I think on the fourth, on the fourth of June, yeah. at noon, with another writer, Phil Keith, to talk about uh, writers and war, to talk about you know their own experiences with covering war, writing about war, and their interest in the subject of wars. Is that correct, Tom? Yeah. So yeah. I hope you'll we'll try to find some flyers by the end of the evening. Anyway, please welcome yeah. Tom Clayton. Hi, thank you. Uh, when Penny and I first discussed this topic of uh, the five best World Series involving New York, I thought it would be very easy. You know, any one of us probably could just rattle off, oh, that series, or that series. But when you, when you think about the whole history of it, I always started from 1920 forward. You know, I didn't go before 1920. And when you consider there have been really four New York teams that have played in World Series, uh, some of them many, many times, uh, the Yankees, the New York Giants, the Brooklyn Dodgers, and the New York Mets. And so many of their contests were, the, the, the World Series they played in were, were really classics. It was really hard. How do you boil it down to five? Uh, the New York Yankees, for example, have 27 championships. How do you select maybe one or two or three that were the best of those 27? Uh, Mets have two championships. How do you you know, do you count both, or can you only count one? Uh, Brooklyn Dodgers, you know, I have a soft spot in my heart for the Brooklyn Dodgers, and especially having done a book on Gil Hodges and, and knowing, getting, getting, having, having the privilege of knowing members of the Hodges family. And, uh, and just looking at the Yankees, too, do you, do, you, do you pick one or two from the Ruth Gehrig years? Or what about the DiMaggio years? And you have the Stengel Mantle, Whitey Ford, Yogi Berry years. Then you have more recently the, the Durham Munson, Reggie Jackson, Ron Guidry years. And then you get into the 1990s where they had uh, Jeter and Paul O'Neill and, and, and Bernie Williams and all of a sudden. How do you? What's that? 
it's, a, it's, it's just a, it's too much to choose from, it seems. So I, I did two things. I did five runners up and then the five best. So I'll discuss those. And on the, on the, on the one I, I think the best, I cheated a little bit. So, and yes, my shirt is, it was a gift to me a few months ago. Uh, uh, it, is, it is not a Los Angeles Dodgers shirt. I'm fully supporting the Mets tonight. I hope it's over by the third inning. <laughs> you know, they're, they're ahead so much by the third inning that the other innings are just to let the champagne get colder. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, but I, I, so this is a Brooklyn Dodgers shirt. Um, I'm going to tell you what my five runners up are and then just briefly like explain it. And you know, if any time anybody has a you know a question, just just go ahead and ask it. I, I would guess if I went around the room, if I went around the room, I wonder if what the, the the question would be, what is the best World Series involving a New York team or teams? You know, I I probably get I get I get 15 different answers from people. I bet I would. Everybody has their own personal favorite. It may depend on your age too. Uh, you know, I I. I remember the first World Series I ever remember, and I was at a game, but as a kid, I was brought to the game, was the Yankees and Pirates in 1960. Uh, some people, you know, remember the World Series before the 1950s, and you get into the 60s with the, the Mantle Marish years, uh, and they had some great, uh, great contests. But um, the, my five runners up are not in any particular order. It's just that as I started to think about, I think they're the ones that, as I was reading them out, didn't make the top five cut. Um, and what I picked was, uh, and I, what I tried to do is most exciting, most meaningful, had some kind of impact and some kind of significance. So that was sort of like what I did. And this is a bit of a subjective list, but I really did the research to try and get more information on each one of these. And one runner-up I picked was uh, 2001 Arizona Diamondbacks <coughs> against the New York Yankees. And a big, you know, it was really a great series. There were there were two there were two extra inning games. There were three late inning comebacks. Uh, you had uh, uh, the, the whole specter of 9/11 hanging over that World Series. I mean, I think a lot of people in the country. One of, one of the very very few times that maybe a majority of the people in the country wanted the Yankees to win. <laughs> uh, the whole idea of New York rebounding, I mean, just like after the Boston bombing, they wanted the Red Sox to, to win, that kind of thing. It's a way to show resiliency. Uh, and I think a lot of people thought they would win. They had already won three, they had won four out of the past five World Series, they had won three in a row. They had the same team, <coughs> they called the core four, but they still had Brosius, they had Neil, they had Tino Martinez, uh, they had Clemens. I mean, they had, they had just a great, great team. And, um, but the thing they ran into was uh, uh, Johnson and Schilling. The, the Randy Johnson and Kurt Schilling, you know, it was one of those cases like, like Kopax and Drysdale had shown. If you have two great pitchers in a small and a short series, that could be enough. And uh, hopefully not for the Dodgers of today. Um, but uh, you, they had, you know, Randy Johnson and Kurt Schilling, they went 4 0 in that World Series. They had, they had a 1.40 ERA. Uh, they struck out 45, 45 Yankees in 39 innings. It was just a dominating performance. And yet it came down, some of you remember it, it came down to the last inning. You know, the Yankees were leading, as I recall, going, that's why they brought Mariano in. They were leading 2-1. to one. They lost in the bottom of the ninth, 3-2. to two. And I clearly remember, I don't know if some of you remember the, the, Tim McCarver's comment, before that pitch was thrown by Mariano to Luis Gonzalez, he said something like that, left field, that he thought was playing too far out. Gonzalez, if he's going to hit it to left, is not going to be able to get much power behind it. What does Gonzalez do? He gets a little flare over Jeter's head, drops in, winning run scores, 4-3. to three. The, uh, three to 3-2 was the game, and that was the end of the series. Um, another one I, I picked as a runner-up was the Dodgers and the Yankees in 1977. And some people consider, might consider that one a top five World Series. Most people remember it because it was the three home run Reggie Jackson game. And it was a great, it was a great World Series performance. The series itself was not a great series. The Yankees won a four to two. Uh, they had it pretty much, you know, pretty much in hand. It, it was kind of significant in a couple other ways. When the Yankees won the World Championship in 77, it was the first time they had won the series in 15 years. It was, it was the longest drought in their history. So that was important. It was also the first World Series the Yankees won under under the ownership of George Steinbrenner. So it was it was a big 
big deal that they won it, but I wouldn't pick them in the top five, even with that great performance by Reggie. Um, one of my personal favorites is a runner-up for me. Is going to, you go back, okay, 15, what was that last World Series they won 15 years earlier? Yankees and San Francisco Giants, 1962. And a big reason why I think that it's a great series, still not the top five, is that you have on both teams great players in their prime. And it went down to seven games and it went down to the last out. Obviously in the Yankees you had Maris and Mail and Vera was still on the team. Whitey Ford was still pitching well. Uh, good, great role players like Hector Lopez and Johnny Blanchard. And, uh, you know, Tom, Tom, I, don't think, I think Tresh was working in the year. You had, uh, the, the short, the short, Bobby Richardson in second, Tony Kubek hit. It was a great team. But then you look at the San Francisco Giants, Willie Mays, Willie McCovey, Juan Marichal. I mean, one great player after another. I think Orlando Cepeda might have been on that team. Then. And they clashed. They were the two best teams there were, and they're great teams. And it all came down to, if any of you are old enough to remember this, it was the bottom of the ninth. That was the ninth inning. And the Yankees were clinging to a one-run lead. Ralph Terry, in those days, they tried to finish games. You know, nowadays, if you get through three innings, they lift you for somebody else. But Ralph Terry was, was, was on the mound, and uh, he uh, was determined to finish out the game. The bases were loaded. And uh, Ralph Hopp, the manager, comes out to talk to him. And he get, Ralph Hopp gets out there. And I was just re reviewing this because there's a write-up about one of, one of my books, uh, biography of Roger Maris, and Willie Mays, I think, was on second. The bases were loaded. Willie McCovey was coming up to the plate, and he was a very scary hitter, right? And how comes, how comes out, and Terry's out there, and uh, Hauk says to him, I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and Terry says, well, why are you here? And Hauk says, I don't know, because I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I, I really have no advice to tell you. And somebody's looking at Willie May starts laughing, on second he starts laughing because he's listening to this conversation. He's hoping to pick up some strategy. Yeah. And they're all standing around saying, we don't know what to do. <laughs> so finally Ralph says, well, I guess I'll go back to the dugout. Okay. And he leaves. And Ralph Terry says, okay, I'm just going to, um, I don't know if I ran enough of the tank, but I'm just going to do my best. And, um, Bobby Richardson had been part of that huddle, and he said, and, and uh, uh, I can't remember the third baseman was. The third baseman said, "Bobby, I hope he hits it to you because I'm too scared. If he hits it, to me, I and it must have been Boyer, Cleet Boyer. Cleet Boyer said, if he hits it to me, I'm going to drop it. I, I don't know what to do.' So that's the, 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 and it broke up. Okay, well, let's see what happens. <laughs> Ralph Terry and he threw one, and William Covey hit it right on the nose, as hard as you could hit the hit a ball, right at Bobby Richardson. If Richardson hadn't put his glove up, it would have went right through him. Would have been a whole, they got a cartoon, a whole lot of this. And Richardson just put his hand up, you know, hoping this thing's not going to, I'm not going to catch it, it's going to put me in the right field bleachers. Caught the ball, and the World Series. So it doesn't make the top five, but it was a great World Series. Uh, now, this one, it, you might think it's a little bit of a stretch, but also a runner up for me was when the New York Giants beat the New York Yankees in eight games in 1921. What's that? Eight games. This was the this some significant things about this World Series. This was the last time they used the five of nine format. So in those days, from 1921 previously, you had to win five of nine games to win the World Championship. Uh, so this was the last time they did it. It was the first time the Yankees were flexing their muscles as a team with potential for championship. Uh, it was it was a passing of the torch in a sense that. John McGraw was the leader of the New York Giants. They won a bunch of world championships. You had this new, new manager, Miller Huggins, and the New York Yankees, who had, had this new player, Babe Ruth, on his, this was pre-Gary. And uh, all the games were played at the Polo Ground. The entire World Series, eight games, were played in the same stadium. Because the Yankees didn't have one. And so here they have their first successful season, and they go to the World Series, and they actually had they were, they were up three games to two, and then, the, then the, the, the Giants won the last three games to win the World Series. But it was significant because, the, by, by the way, the Giants is now feeling in Casey Stengel. Uh, it was significant because also, the Yankees proving that they were actually a legitimate team 
they, they ramped up the efforts, well, they need their own stadium. So it was because of this World Series and their showing of almost winning the World Championship that it, they, they, they accelerated efforts and the Yankee Stadium was built. So I, I think that's kind of significant. And also that changing of the guard kind of thing with the Yankee upstarts against the venerable New York Giants. Um, the, uh, uh, another, let me just make a picture I have this correct. Okay. Uh, another um, uh, contender that I did make the top five was the Yankees against the Milwaukee Braves in 1958. A lot of people don't remember that, but uh, his, 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 his reason for significance, a couple of reasons for it. Uh, again, you had two teams with great players, Hall of Famers on there. Uh, obviously, with the Yankees, you had Ford and Mantle and Yogi Berra and, and a bunch of others, good, good role players like a Hank Bauer and, and guys like that. And, and uh, uh, the, the Braves had Henry Aaron, Eddie Matthews, Warren Spahn, and the Braves had beaten the Yankees in '57 for the World Championship. And in '58, the Yankees were down three games to one, and it looked like for two years in a row, it's unheard of. The Yankees could lose the World Series two years in a row. It's not possible. But they became only the second team in Major League Baseball history to come back from a three to one deficit to win a world championship. And it's kind of interesting too that the Braves and the Yankees would not meet again for thirty-eight years. I think it was a, they would not when the Braves by this point were Atlanta. It's strange because two great organizations that always seem to have quality teams, but it would not be till nineteen ninety six that the Yankees and the Braves met again in the World Series. <coughs> So I think that was kind of significant. Um, and the other runner-up I thought of was uh, the uh, Pirates against the Yankees in 1960. And it was, again, it went, it went seven games, and it was, uh, there, there was, it was kind of a, it was, a, it was a, a series that made the Yankees angry. One was because Casey Stengel, decided not to pitch Whitey Ford in the first game. And what that meant was when it got to the, and you know Whitey Ford was money in the World Series. I mean, you just put Whitey Ford out there and the other team is saying, well, we know we're going to lose today. Let's see if we can get tomorrow's game. Great competitor in the series. But Stengel decided that he wanted to give Ford another, another day or two, or two of rest. He started, I can't remember if it was Bob Turley or somebody like that. And the Yankees, the Yankees lost the game. So when it came, and Ford did pitch in the series, but when they got to game seven, Ford couldn't pitch. You know, he was pitched out because he had pitched a couple of games. He needed to pitch game two and three, and then either five or six. And so they had to go with, with uh, it was, became such a free for all uh, in, that, in that game, uh, in that game seven. Lead changes all throughout game seven. Um, the, the, uh, some people consider that game you know, arguably the best World Series game ever played. It probably has been eclipsed from it. But uh, the Yankees lost. And some of you remember the dramatic way the Yankees lost is Bill Mazeroski, uh, who is a Hall of Famer now. Uh, he, he was, the game was played in Pittsburgh. And in the bottom of the ninth inning, uh, he hit the home run that won the game for the, for the Pittsburgh Pirates. And Yogi Berra always said that and, and Yogi was playing left field. You know, a lot of people don't remember because we have we so associate Yogi Berra with being a catcher. But in his later years, he had pretty much given the catching duties over to Elston Howard and Johnny Blanchard as a backup too. And so he was playing a lot of outfield. And he turned himself into a good outfielder. You know, he was a good. He had a good sense of the ball and he, you know, not not a graceful outfielder, but an effective one. And when he uh, he he thought that he didn't think the ball was going to go out of the stadium, he he was prepared. To bounce, have it bounce off, and he was going to throw the ball into the infield. And he's described uh, his the, the, the sinking feeling he had when the ball won't come down. You know, he's waiting for it to come down and hit there, and it doesn't. It just keeps going. And then he had to turn around again and realize that's it. It's over. Um, okay. Uh, now I'm going to go number five to number one. I made a little mistake there, which I'll correct in a bit. To me, number five to go from the number five to the, to the number one, the best. Uh, number five for me was the uh, Yankees defeating the Mets in the 2000 World Series. And 
you know, some people might say, well, that's definitely, why isn't that number one? Yankees, Mets, I mean, what could be more exciting than that? It was very exciting. But it wasn't a great series, you know? I mean, it was, it was a fun series in a lot of ways, but uh, it's, it, I mean, signif one significance of it, it was the first time in 44 years that two New York teams met in the World Series. Okay, so that was kind of significant. Significant that the Mets had not been in the World Series since '86. Okay, significant that it was just a uh, you know a really good team. It was sort of like a, a you know they used to have the Mayor's Trophy game when the Yankees and Mets would play an exhibition game. This was like the Mayor's Trophy game on steroids. You know? uh, but that, after the the uh, you had the uh, speaking of steroids, you had that incident where Roger Clemens threw the bat at Mike Piazza. You know, what was that all about? How, how juiced was he, I guess, that, that uh, some of you don't remember, uh, Piazza had, had uh, hit a ball off Clemens pitching and his bat broke. And Clemens picked up a piece of the broken bat and threw it at Piazza as he was running down the first base. No, nobody, even Clemens couldn't explain it. it was, I mean, he tried a little bit like I was trying to get it out of the way. Well, what's getting it out of the way? You get a hit for it. You get a hit. Yeah, you get a hit. The Mets catcher at the temple with it. That's getting it out of the way. I think you want to get Piazza out of the way. Piazza always gets. Piazza did a lot of people really well, but he did club. He always did club. Yeah. But the Yankees won the first two games in Yankee Stadium. They did. It took them 12 innings in the first game. Mets won the third game, but then the Yankees won three to two and four to two, so it was not a riveting series. So I, I think it has to be. I put it in the top five because Yankees Mets. You know, I mean, it's it's, it's undeniable a, a, a great clash, and also it was the last championship for some of the great Yankee players of those great '90s teams. It was the last one for Paul O'Neill. It was the last one for Tino Martinez. The last one for Bernie Williams, it was the last one for Scott Brosius. You know, they never won a championship again after that. Now, as we know, there was the core four, as they were so called, was Posada, Jeter, Pettit, and Mariano, right? They did get a chance to win one more World Series in 2009, but those other fellas had to be were, were retired by that. Um, number four, this is where I made a mistake. My, my number four is, is the Yankees and Giants, uh, New York Giants. And 1921, because of that passing of the torch. It was the very first Subway Series, if you think about it. It was the very first in 1921, because the, uh, the Giants were the dominant team in New York baseball, so they uh, and the Yankees were upstarts. They had been the Highlanders, and they were a, a bad or okay team. But finally, 1921 came along, and people could actually get on subways and go to the Polo Grounds. Like I said, it was the only stadium used in all eight games at the Polo Grounds. Um, it also was a signal. Babe Ruth was injured in that World Series, <clears throat> but he had, you know, a very good year in 1921. <clears throat> and the Yankees being in the series, really, even though he's played the limited bases, sort of showcased who was emerging. As the great, the greatest player in baseball, which he would prove to be all throughout the 1920s. Uh, for me, number three on the list uh, was the when the Mets defeated the Red Sox in 1986. I mean, it was it was it wasn't the Mets' first championship, but it was it was a great series, uh, and it was back and forth. You had I mean, again, you had two teams with great rosters. The Mets, you know, the Mets that year won 108 games. You know, I mean, they had a great season. Davey Johnson was their manager. Uh, they had Gary Carter, Doc Gooden, Daryl Strawberry, Keith Hernandez. It was it was a superpower team that lived up to its potential. I mean, how many times do we see teams with a lot of potential, a lot of really good players, and they underachieve? You know, but I think that was said this year about the Washington. Uh, <laughs> Nationals. Yeah, I mean everybody had them penned in as as, as possibly the world champion this year, and the, the, the wheels came off that team. Um, so uh, and bought. So you had that on, on the on the uh, they oh the Mets that year, they won their division not by ten games, not by twenty games, by twenty one and a half games. I mean, did the, the rest of the teams show up after the All Star game? 
So it was just a great team. And then you had uh, the Boston had only 95 wins. So you're talking about a team where there was a, a you know five, to eight, a 13 win differential between the two. But they had you know really good players. They had a young Clemens, they had Jim Rice, they had Dwight Evans, Oil Can Boyd. I remember his old boy, Oil Can. He was a good money player too, a good money pitcher. Um, uh, there was some sentiment for Boston because Boston had been in the World Series in 1946 and lost in the seventh game in the last inning to the St. Louis Cardinals. Boston had been in the 75 World Series and lost to the Cincinnati Reds. <coughs> Here's Boston's chance again. They had not had championships since 1918. So there was some sentiment for Boston. And uh, the Sox were actually up 3-2 to two in the series. And then they went back to Shea Stadium for the final, what could have been the final game, it turned out to be the final two games. Uh, in the 10th inning, I mean, it was a, six games was really one of the, you know, if you talk about top 10 game, games in World Series history. Uh, the score is tied. Uh, Boston um, is, is, is up, the scores two runs at the top of the 10th inning. So the Mets were down to the bottom of the 10th inning. In the sixth game, or, or it's over right there. And uh, I just happened to be, I just happened upon this book. The, the Mets, the Mets scored the winning run. I remember this guy. He looked familiar at all. Buckner, poor Bill Buckner. <laughs> poor Bill Buckner. He he was playing first baseman, and I don't think he was an experienced first baseman. Wasn't Bill Buckner more an outfielder for much of his career? Maybe I'm wrong. Did he play first? Okay. He was, he was the first baseman, but they had a better field, better, better fielding first baseman on his bench. Oh. He had terrible feet. Oh. He was just ankles. Okay. And he had trouble bending over. Yeah, well, this... That, that was a mess of bending. And that's exactly what happened, because he, Mookie Wilson comes up, I think it was Ray Knight, was on second base, maybe, something like that, and Mookie comes up and hits a... Dribbler down the first base, which I guess for most first base would be an easy put out, and it dribbled through Buckner's legs and went to the outfield. And and uh, it was it was a two out, so it goes through Buckner's leg. Uh, Ray Knight scored. The game was over six to five, sending it to a seventh game, which the Mets, which the Mets won for the '86 championship. Uh, most of you have heard of, of Vince Scully, right? I mean, Vince Scully is one of the great great broadcasters of all time. And he started out uh, broadcasting for the Brooklyn Dodgers back in, I think, 1948, 49, something like that. He's still broadcasting for the, for the Los Angeles Dodgers. We won't hear him in the series because he had some surgery recently, but he, he did announce that last year would be his next, next year would be his last year as a broadcaster, which makes a lot of people sorry because uh, even, you know, he is well into his 80s, but he's still a sharp entertaining, enjoyable broadcast. They're one of a kind, really. And Scully also knew, one of his secrets was he knew when to talk and what to say, and when not to talk. And when, after he said, Buckner boots the ball, something like that, through his legs, into the outfield, uh, right night scores, the Mets win, the Mets win. For the next three minutes, he was silent. He didn't say a word for three minutes. Believe me, people counted. Because, what was happening on the field, and what was what was the, the crowd noise and everything was telling the whole story. That's very remarkable that somebody would think to do that. You know, to think in the rush. I mean, how many times are we we're listening, watching a broadcast of a sporting event, and people are just babbling on too much. You know, whether everything's an exclamation point. And 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 that he was he was uh, he was really just a smart smart man. And well, you know, us baseball fans will, will definitely miss him. Um, now, my number two pick, which is a tough one, because I think for a lot of people it would be, you know, a, a maybe a, a, a number one. Uh, I'm going to say, I'm saying it's the, when the, uh, the, the Mets defeated the Orioles in 1969. And I really seesawed with that. Because I think I was heavily influenced by that season being the Miracle Mets. I mean, that was, you know, the Mets had only existed since 1962. They had been awful year after year when Casey Stengel was manager. I think Wes Western was manager for a while. 
Uh, they bring over Gil Hodges, who had been managing, uh, Bill, Gil Hodges had been managing the Washington Senators. And uh, Gil had been on the Mets in 63, I think it was. He and Duke Snyder were reunited in 63 on the Mets. Again, an awful team. And then the Senators basically traded for Hodges to be their manager, because Washington was a pretty abysmal team. And year after year, the Senators got better. And uh, until 1968 rolls around, and the Mets got the uh, uh, Gil Hodges from the Senators. And it was, it was tough for, for Gil Hodges. He, 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 liked, he liked the Washington Senators. He liked that he had built a club there that was, had a real chance of a shot of the American League pen another maybe year or two down the road. There was, there was, and, and the players loved him. You know, when working on, on this book of, um, of Gil Hodges to talk to the guys who played for him, they thought he was just a terrific manager and a great guy. And they started to accumulate more and more young talent. And they started to play better every year. But when the Mets reached out to him, and it was a decision he had, you know, he had to look at the situation with his family. He and his wife, Joan, had four children. They all still lived in New York. So he had been for, for several seasons to see his family. He was constantly on the train back and forth between Washington and New York. Uh, his family used to come out to Montauk. They used to fish out in Montauk. Uh, really loved the fishing out here. So uh, he, what, what made the decision for him is, I, I want to come back to New York. I, I want to be with my family. He and his wife and the kids lived on Bedford Avenue in Brooklyn, which Joan, where Joan Hodges, his widow, still lives to this day. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he loved it. He was not a native New Yorker. He was from Indiana, but he came to love New York from the time he came to New York. He first started playing for the Dodgers. His wife was a native New Yorker. Uh, the kids were born and raised in New York. Even when the loss of the Dodgers from Brooklyn moved out to Los Angeles, uh, Gil had his family stay in New York. That was really tough for him to play in Los Angeles to be there, but they were very concerned about their schooling. Uh, he really wanted his kids to have a Catholic education. He didn't think there were any good Catholic schools in Los Angeles. You know, such a hedonistic city like that can't have good Catholic schools. So he wanted to keep his kids in the Catholic schools in Brooklyn. Um, so the opportunity came to come back to New York. He took it, and uh, he got handed a team that really didn't have, on the surface, didn't have that much going for it. Uh, but what he saw was that there was a lot of young talent on the team, a lot of, a lot of young players that was starting to show some promise. And he thought, you know, maybe in you know, the two or three years we get these guys to mature. Uh, and the 68 season showed some promise. Uh, then what happened is they're playing in Atlanta in August of 1968, and Gil has a heart attack during the game. So they treat him for the heart attack, his season's done. And they even wanted that Gil would come back for the 1969 season, but he you know, did what he was supposed to do, which was Included stopping smoking, and he's a heavy smoker. And uh, he was back there for spring training in '69. And I mean, nobody could have expected what the '69 season turned out to be. And it was a it was a so-so season. But suddenly the Mets took off. I mean, they had like a 10 game winning streak. They were everybody. Uh, they did not have a super talented, and mature, experienced team. The one exception was Cleon Jones. I think led the led the league in batting that year. But you had this young pitching staff, Tom Seaver and Jerry Kuzman, uh, a young Nolan Ryan. Uh, you had these guys like Ron Swoboda, Eddie Cranefield, uh, Al Weiss, uh, Bud Harrelson, Ed, Ed Charles, was that? Tommy Agee was a very, very good center. He, he was one of the few good, experienced guys. And they had traded for him, I think they had gotten him from, from an American League club. I can't remember which one it is. Maybe the White Sox is the White Sox. And Agee came over, he, he was an excellent center fielder. Um, and so, uh, in the bullpen, they had nobody at the time was a real. They had Tug McGraw, but he was still young. You know, he was not as dominant as he was going to become as a reliever. They had uh, Ron Taylor. Uh, they had some other guys, and then they made a great trade in the middle of the season for a fellow named Don Condon. And he was a veteran player. I think he was maybe 33, 34 at the time. And it always seemed in the '69 season that when they needed a clutch hit, Don Condon got that clutch hit. And so they ended up, oh, I should point out, 1969 was the first year of the divisional playoffs. 
So it wasn't, you know, any other season previous to that, you win and you're automatically in the World Series. They won their division, but they had to play the Atlanta Braves. And nobody gave them a chance against the Atlanta Braves, and they won against the Atlanta Braves. And then they had to play the Baltimore Orioles in the World Series, a super team. You know, they, they were, you know, Sandy was a superstore, Orioles was a super team. You know, they had, they had Brooks Robinson, Frank Robinson, Boone Powell, uh, I can't remember, it was Elrod Hendricks or Andy Echebarren behind the plate. Uh, they had uh, Dave McNally, a very young Jim Palmer. Uh, it was, I think Mike Cuellar was on that team. He, he might have even a Cy Young Award winner that year. They were a super team, and here, here are the Mets, you know, who got lucky <laughs> that the Chicago Cubs collapsed and gave them the division, and that Atlanta Braves didn't take them seriously, so they were able to sweep by. Well, that's not going to happen. And what happens the first game of the World Series? Tom Seaver loses. You know, he lost that. He lost that that, that first game. Uh, but again, I think it was because of the management they had, Gil Hodges, who was, you know, a, such a steady, calm influence that um, uh, he, you know, unfortunately for him and his health, he would keep things inside. That's how he would deal with stress. He would keep it inside. He wouldn't talk about things, you know. He would only say things that he wanted to say that he thought would be good for players or good for others. Uh, he was always trying to be positive about things. And, you know, just as a, a short detour, uh, but when I started working on the Gil Hodges biography, one of the things I did when I, I got together with Gil Hodges Jr. several times, uh, and, and Joan Hodges, and one of the daughters. But I said to Gil Jr. one time, I said, you know, your father was in the Marines, and um, what, what, did, uh, what did he do in the war? You know, do you know anything about his, his military background? He said, you know, when I was about 12, 13 years old, I asked that, my father that question. I said, you know, I know you were in the Marines, and you were away while we were kids, because the war was going on in World War II. What did you do? He said, I sat at a desk. That's what he did. He said, they sat at a desk. They gave me reports to look through. I'd write another report, move it on to the next person. That's what I did. And thankfully, I did not take that as at face value. Uh, I had done a couple of previous books involving the Marine Corps, so I had good Marine Corps sources. And I started to you know, help have people dig out the actual records, the actual com after action reports, combat records, service reports, service files, things like that. Gil Hodges landed in the first wave at Okinawa. Yeah. Uh, he was a he was bronze star for bravery. Uh, there was one time when uh, uh, he was he was banning he was part of an artillery unit, and during the night the Japanese had landed paratroopers behind their lines who attacked at dawn. It even got down to hand to hand fighting, and they took and they had that's the way they, the artillery unit survived. They actually had to do hand to hand fighting until the Japanese were dead or, or surrendered. And uh, he was he was right at the time that he was been signed by the Brooklyn Dodgers. Gil went into the Marine Corps, and he stayed they stayed in full time. He didn't get out to forty five. And he, you know he, at the, when he was you know he was 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. He was in the Marine Corps fighting overseas. So I was the one that gave all this information. I had more of it, of course. I gave it to Gil Jr. And he was thunderstruck. He was actually a little mad. He was angry. But he but. What, what Joan said when I asked Joan Hodges about it, he, he didn't want to talk about killing people. He didn't want to talk to his children about what he might have done, even though he had the best reasons to do it. He didn't want, to, he didn't want his children to think of that side of him, that he could be somebody who could be hurting other people, because he was not that kind of man. He always wanted to present himself as a, as a, as a gentle man. Um, anyway, so here we get into the World Series, and uh, the Mets, if they lose the first game, they swept the next four. Okay. They, the Orioles were like dumbfounded. They, they lost the first game at the tie the series 1-1, and then they never recovered. Uh, there was the famous uh, shoe polish incident involving Cleon Jones, where the Mets really needed to get a guy on base, and Cleon Jones was batting, and the, the pitch comes in, and Cleon Jones contends, well, it hit my foot. And the ball had bounced into the Mets dugout. And so the umpire calls time and says, give me that ball. Now, what happened after that, working on this book, I, I've heard three or four different stories. One is the story the umpire accepted, that, that the ball I got handed to him was, Cleo, was the ball that Cleon Jones that had shoe polish on it because it hit him in the shoe. All right? Jerry Kuzman contends 
that somebody went into the bag of balls they had on the bench, and they looked, they found one that had some fruit, and they, they threw it out to the umpire. Um, so one of the other players, I think it was Svoboda, Ron Svoboda said, well, I saw Gil get a ball and rub it against his own shoe, and then toss it out in the field. Who knows what's correct? Knowing Gil Hyde's character, I have a hard time believing that he would cheat even if it meant the World Series. But, you know, they won that game. Uh, it, it may be the most memorable, for New York fans, maybe the most memorable World Series victory that you had the Mets beat, uh, the Miracle Mets uh, beat the, uh, uh, the, the, the Orioles. And if I can, um, I don't think I have it here. There, there is a, there is a uh, uh, in, in, the, in the Gil Hodge's book, there's a, there's a recollection from, uh, from Joan Hodges that, uh, that Gil, Gil was, you know, smiled after, the, after the, the last out was made and everybody was happy. And then he, he went, he, he started to, to, to break down and his, a couple of his coaches took him into a side room because it was finally all coming out of him, all the stress and everything else. And he didn't want his players, especially in a moment of such great joy, seeing tears coming from his eyes. So as his coaches, uh, I think it was well, Yogi Berra was one of his coaches, and um, Yost, Scott Ned Yost, the father of the Kansas City Manager, uh, I can't remember his name, Eddie Yost, I think it was. They took him into another room so he could get out of his system in private, and then when he was done, he came back out, and they had, as you can imagine, quite the, the, the victory party. So my number one, and here's where, I'm, here's where I cheated, is I'm actually going to uh, pick two World Series, one right after one year right after the other, and then sort of explain it. And in the two series I'm going to pick, and that's really the reason for my shirt, is uh, the Yankees and the Dodgers in 1955 and 56. It's I think you know it's it's uh, and let me explain. You know, younger fans don't realize that before there were the Yankees and the Mets rivalry. You know, there were decades of rivalries, not just two, but three teams in New York. Dodgers, the Giants, and the Yankees. And earlier in the years, it was mostly the New York Giants that were the better team. Then the Yankees became descendant. The Dodgers had a blip in 1941 when they did get to the World Series, and they, they poor Mickey Owen, the catcher, the pass ball always gets blamed for losing that World Series for the Dodgers. But And, you know, the... the the Yankees had uh, the Yankees had lost again to the New York Giants in 1922. Then they broke through and won in 23. And the, and McGraw and the Giants faded. Miller Huggins and the Yankees were a great team after that. They beat the Giants again in the World Series in 1936 and 37. They faded away. <clears throat> Things started to change in 1947 because that was when the the maneuverings, the farm system of Branch Rickey, the general manager of the Dodgers started to bear fruit. You started to get these young players, who weren't starters yet, most of them, but you started to get these young players that were getting some taste of Major League Baseball with Don Dukem, Gil Hodges, uh, uh, Duke Snyder. The biggest change, of course, which is probably the biggest change in, in baseball of all time, was the addition of Jackie Robinson, 47 was his first year. And so the Dodgers actually made it to the, uh, and, and he had veteran players too. He had Pete Reiser, uh, Pee Wee Reese, uh, some others. Um, Campanello was still very young. I don't know if he was playing catcher. He, I, I doubt he was starting yet in 47, but it was back when Hodges first got to the Dodgers to be catcher. Um, but, uh, Billy Cox was a third baseman. Yep, yep, yep. So they had good players. Uh, and they made it to the World Series in 47. And uh, they. They came close. They came close to winning, but they ran into the Yankees. Mm -hmm. uh, and you had uh, the Yankees had not won in '46, the pennant in '46, but now they had their, things were back in gear in '47. They lost. To, they lost to the Yankees in '47. Every you know, both the Yankees and Dodgers had an off year in 1948 because, well, the American League, the Cleveland Indians were such a, such a great team in '48. '49, the Dodgers had by that point their great starting lineup that was going to be their lineup, with a couple of exceptions for the next seven or eight seasons. Uh, you, you know, and you had, you had Pee Wee is short, 
Uh, Jackie was at second or at first. You had Campanella catching. You had Hodges at first. Uh, Duke Snyder was patrolling center field. Uh, Don Newcomb. Uh, oh, Carrillo. Oh, oh, that's right, right field. Was he, was he the reading rifle? Yes. Reading yeah. rifle. Ready rifle. Ready rifle. Yeah. And uh, he, he was, Carl Ferrillo was for the Do Brooklyn Dodgers, sort of like what uh, Tommy Hendrick was like for the Yankees. You know, very reliable, really good outfielder, reliable guy who, who did not have a Hall of Fame career, but who was, you know, one of the best, the, the best out guy at his position for seven, eight, maybe nine seasons. Uh, although Hendrick once said he played along, for 10 or 11 seasons, he played alongside Joe DiMaggio in the outfield for the Yankees. They never once had dinner. But I was, it says something more about DiMaggio than I think it says about Henry. Um, so anyway, the idea was, okay, now it's time for the, this young Dodger team to take control and show the Yankees their reign was over. The Yankees had a new manager in Casey Stengel. DiMaggio was getting old. You know, that this looked like this could be it. So of course the Yankees won the series 4-1. Very disappointing. So, but then you start getting into 1952. Dodgers and Yankees again. That's enough. It's a seven-game struggle. Uh, the the uh, Hodges goes into his famous slump, and in which he couldn't buy a hit. I think he was over 23 or something like that. And this was the guy who was the anchor of your lineup. Him and Snyder, the run-producing guys. He couldn't he couldn't buy a hit. And you probably some of you heard the anecdotes that what was happening is 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 during the slump of the World Series. That, that Sunday, pastors and priests and everybody in the churches all throughout Brooklyn were telling to cut mass short today, I want you to go home and pray for Gil <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, it was, it was everything, you know, because they loved him in Brooklyn. They, they really did. And, and he was big. Even when, even when he was in a slump and he would, go, he would go head up to the plate to bat, there were no booze coming from the, the, the crowd at, 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 at its field. You know, they love Gil Hodges. So the Dodgers were actually up three games to two. And the Yankees took the next two games. Uh, it was their fourth straight championship in 1952. But it was kind of significant. It was their first one without DiMaggio. Because he had retired after the 51 championship. So they, they, and, and Mantle was on the team by then, but he was still trying to find his way. So it really was a lot of, you know, Vera, role players and others uh, that, that made it happen. Young know, Billy Martin. 53 again, Yankees Dodgers. Uh, but this one, the Yankees won in six games. Uh, and the Dodgers, by this point, were really questioning themselves. Do we not want it as much as the Yankees do? Are we not as good as the Yankees? We think we are. They certainly, talent wise, were as good or better than the Yankees. 54, neither team made it into the series. Uh, I think it was for the New York, I think it was the New York Giants and the Indians in Cleveland. Cleveland had that great pitching staff Bob Lemon, Bob Feller. Yeah. There's a story about Bob Feller that when he, he enlisted the day after Pearl Harbor. And after the war, apparently, he would, would shun and not speak to Yogi Berra when they saw each other. They would, he would not even acknowledge Yogi's presence for some reason. And, and somebody asked him why he did that. He said, well, you know, I, I'm not aware that Yogi had never had, he never talks about being in the war. He must have just sat it out someplace. Or he played baseball and through the war. And somebody had to tell him afterwards, well, you know, Yogi was there. He was he was storming the beaches on D-Day. He had a distinguished and courageous war record. After that, Bob Fell sought him out and said, "I'm sorry, you know, you're you're you're, the, you're my best pal now." <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> 55, it all came together. Dodgers win the pennant. Yankees win the pennant. And it goes to it's the seventh game. They're tied 3-3. And the game is, as I as I recall, at Yankee Stadium because the Dodgers had to get on their buses and come from Brooklyn to Yankee Stadium. And uh, it may have been even on the bus that they decided we're going to start Johnny Padres. Now, Johnny Padres be turned into a, a very good pitcher. But I think he was 21 years old. And he had this, and he wanted the ball. He was this brash 21-year-old. I want the ball. I, will, I, I can beat these guys. And he went out and he did it. He went out and beat the Yankees in the seventh game. And the, uh, the, uh, uh, Bus, buses with the players went from Yankee Stadium back into Brooklyn. Fans all along the way cheering. They get to Brooklyn, big cheering and everything. 
uh, newspaper headlines were immediately produced like, uh, who's the bumps? And, and this is next year because the Dodgers had always said, well, they had, you know, every time they lost the World Series, or wait till next year, you know, so the headline was, this is next year. It was, it was a great victory, and people did not know at the time the significance of it in that it was, it was the last chance, really, for the Dodgers. Because, and the reason why I lumped them together I, is that in 56, it was another seven-game series, it was the Dodgers and the Yankees, but the Dodgers were starting to age a little bit. Jackie Robinson was well, was well into his 30s by then. Uh, Snyder was in his 30s. Hodges, uh, uh, Campanella uh, was in his 30s. Don Dukin was in his 30s. And all these guys who were still great players, but they were, they were aging. And it went to a seven-game series. Many people, one reason why it's a great World Series is people remember Don Larson's perfect game in 1956. Uh, but it's it's a bittersweet kind of thing to think about that series because it was uh, it, it neither ne the, the Dodgers did not make the World Series in '57 and then left. You know they moved out to Los Angeles. The New York Giants same year '57 after the '57 season moved out to Los Angeles. Suddenly they could not be any more Subway Series because there was only one team left. Uh, it would be it would be 44 years. Well, there's another subway series in New York. It's kind of kind of sad, but that's 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 the way it worked out. So, I, to me, if you, if you put those two together, I mean, if I probably had to choose, <coughs> I think because of the, the intensity of the interest around all of New York, I would probably pick '55 as the best New York World Series. Uh, not not that things weren't as intense with. When the Yankees played the Mets in 2000, the fan base was very excited, but it, had a five, it was a five-game World Series. In 55, it went down to the last game, and the team that had been trying, the, the, the overachieving team from the other side of the track, so to speak, the other side of the, of the river, finally did it for those boys of summer. They finally had their championship. And it turned out they would never have an opportunity again. But I put them together because, you know, those two, two, they played 14 games in 55 and 50s, 14 World Series games. And each time the last game decided the World Series, and it was the end of an era, really, of Subway Series, uh, of, of Brooklyn you know, Giants and, and the Yankees. So, since 1962, you know, there has been the possibility that the best World Series uh, ever, uh, it was possible, with two New York teams at the same time. It just hasn't happened in 53 years with the, you know, with, with the exception of 2000, but that's not one of, not my top five, or it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not there. So it can still happen. It can still happen. Not this year, <laughs> obviously. Uh, and we'll find out tonight if, uh, if the Mets have an opportunity to do it alone. Let's get to the World Series. Who might they face? You know, they could face either, I guess, the Royals or they could face the uh, Toronto Blue Jays. And who knows? The Mets. Uh, look, I, I pray they win tonight and they get a chance to go to the World Series and they may have an opportunity to actually create the best World Series ever involving New York City teams. That remains to be seen. But uh, but uh, but there you have it. You may disagree or agree, but you've been very patient, very pleasant, and, and thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? His teammates, right? Yeah. Okay. Respect for him. You know, I, I think it was, um, and by the way, if anybody's interested, I have Joe Lines' copies over there. My show is Karanja Maris. Um, I think that, that they finally realized they had to get with this program or they weren't going to win. Because these, again, these, these were young guys. I mean, I interviewed both Crane Pool and Swoboda for the Bill Hines book, among others. And uh, <clears throat> they said that they were cocky young kids. Yes. And they, and, and Hodges was a disciplinarian, and it was his way or the highway. And he was the guy who had had all that World Series experience. What right. experience did these guys have? That's my whole reason for me asking the question. Yeah. Because he did something. In fact, when he walked out there and 
took them all out of Cleon Jones' yes. hand and told him, you go sit down. Right. That's when that team you got all the respect from Gil Hodges right there. And maybe you could take your star out. And and Cleon Cleon anybody can sit with him. He was the star. He was a great hitter. Yes, he was. And, and the, the thing is, Cleon Jones was not one of the guys who was giving Hodges a hard time. No. At all. But, you know, just the point you're making, he, he, had, he had to show that everybody was accountable. And That's what he did. And it was a, definitely a big wake-up call for, the, for, the, for these young guys. There, did I see another hand raised? Yeah, I was going to say that he went out to the left field. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's what happened. These guys like Tug McGraw and Sobota and Crane Poole and Bud Harrelson and, and Kuzmin and Nolan Ryan Jim and uh, who was the pitcher? Uh, Jim, Jim, uh, Gary, Gary Gentry. Gary Gentry. Gary Gentry. Gary Gentry. You know, they had to realize that if we have any chance at all, it's because we have to buy into the guy who has the most experience and who really who's, who's a great player, and we have to listen to what he's saying. And because if not, we're just going to be the same old mess and the same, maybe not even also random, we're going to end up back in last place. Seaver was a guy who was a, a big fan of Hodges right from the beginning. Most people don't know that Seaver was in the Marine Corps. And, and so here was, when, when his manager was a fellow Marine, right away, he said, I, this is the guy I follow. But he, he was the exception, not the rule. Um, as the season went on, the other guys had to fall on the step. So, yes? Yeah, I'm, I'm correct. That was the series in which Tommy Agee and Ron Savota made fantastic catches. And yes. And Ron Savota was not known for being a defensive player. Exactly. Agee was known for being a very good center fielder, but you're right, Savota was not. And it, so it, it reminded me, thinking about that, what, what was the World Series of the playoff when uh, Lou Pinella caught a ball on one bounce in the outfield with the sun in his eyes? He never saw it. It bounced into his glove. And I, I, oh, it was the Yankees playoff game against the Red Sox in 78. You know, the, the, the game that usually people say, Bucky Dent won with a home run, which is not completely true, because that winning run was a Reggie Jackson home run, but Bucky Dent was the one that really put the dagger in there. And when the Red Sox were rallying, there's one play where a guy gets one into the outfield and it bounces, and Lou Pinella was not known for being a defensive whiz. You know, he's sort of wandering around out there wondering where the ball is, and basically bounced, oh, look what I found. <laughs> and because he caught it, threw the ball in, and prevented a run that would have been crucial. Um, anyway, any other questions? Um, oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if the rivalry between the men and the Yankees is as intense as it used to be with the Yankees, Guardians, and Giants. And I'm a kid that grew up in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. It was Yankees. Yeah. <coughs> it wasn't tough either, but I survived. Right. Yeah. But there was an animosity yeah. among who was best center fielder, who was pitching best. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that exists now. I would agree with you based on some personal experience because I am a Yankee fan. I, <clears throat> Some years ago, about, about 10 or 12 years ago, I had an opportunity to introduce my son to Yogi Berra. And I said, here's my son, he's a fourth generation Yankee fan. I came from a Bronx family of Yankee fans. Um, and I still support the Yankees, and I want to see the Yankees do well. And I even supported them during the R.S. Clark years. But if the Yankees, like this year, are not in it, I'm rooting for the Mets. So it's not, it's not a matter of, I, I hate the Mets no matter what. I, first of all, I never hate the Mets. <laughs> I want them to do well, and I will support them 100% now. Uh, I am supporting them 100% the So, for, so I, I, I suspect that's true, that there's probably not that kind of animosity is the word that you use. I hate the Yankees. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not saying, and, and I, know, I, know people, I know Yankee fans who hate the Red Sox and vice versa. I like you sitting in No more. I remember Boston. Well, there's a great rivalry between the Giants <laughs> and Boston. New York Giants. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that really, uh, what was that? Was that 51 was the playoff when the Giants won again? The, the, that was the home run by uh, Thompson. Bobby Thompson. Thompson. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they, one of the reasons they hate each other, too, if I remember correctly, is Leo DeRoche was the manager that year. And he had managed the Dodgers until they, they fired him because he had the. Uh, the, he, 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 he married a divorced actress, Lorraine Day. <laughs> and the Catholic League said, we're going to tell our people not to go to Heaven's Field anymore and watch ball games. So they fired the Russian. 
But don't you think that the rivalry between the two New York teams was basically all about the center fielders? That was a big part of it. He had three great center fielders. You know, I mean, I would not, I would not rate Duke Schneider on this at the same level at, as Mantle and Mays. And I would probably choose Willie Mays over Mantle as far as who was the best. Why would you hitter. want to rate uh, Duke Schneider? I was a dog up there, man. <laughs> Don, Duke, Duke, Schneider, Duke Schneider was a great player, but how, how can you, you know, Willie had 660 home runs. I know. And he had I the know. It's, it's hard. I and, I, and, and Duke Snyder was a good defensive center fielder too, but yes, sometimes you see some of those highlights of Willie Mays playing the outfield, and it was like there was there was nothing he couldn't get to. The big words catch. The big words in '54, right? When he yes. he caught it this way, and he caught the ball like this. So, you know, one of the, one of the reasons why I hope that there's still a rivalry with some animosity part of it. Because it means that we can keep having discussions like this for many, many more years. <laughs> and I think it's great for baseball. It's great for New York. I, I think it's a lot of fun. So, all right, folks. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you being here.